to Hip Use History and welcome to some world history where we're going to continue doing world religions. This time we're going to take a look at the religion of Islam. What's the basic plot? What do people who are Muslims believe? Just enough to grow your brain so you're walking around smarter. How about that? So let's go giddy up for the learning and go get her done right now. Why don't we start in the year 570 in a city called Mecca, where a little baby is born who is called Muhammad. And Muhammad, of course, is going to be the founder of Islam. He's going to be seen as the last of the prophets, according to Muslims who follow Islam. And they're going to call him the great prophet. Now, he's born in 570 to kind of an upper-class Meccan family. He's orphaned as a young boy, kind of moves around a little bit, lives in the desert, lives in the city for a little while. In his teenage years, he gets a chance to visit Syria, where it's said that he has interactions with a Christian monk that has great influence over him. And now, he's not going to, of course, be a Christian. He doesn't see himself as being someone of the Jewish faith, but he does identify with the Abrahamic lineage, that Abraham was a great prophet. This is the first kind of father of Judaism. And then he had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And it's said that Muhammad's lineage goes through Ishmael. But he does believe that Abraham was a prophet, that Moses was a prophet, that Jesus was a prophet. And as he grows into adulthood, he becomes a merchant and an arbitrator, somebody who is greatly respected in Mecca, someone who's seen as being very honest and very, you know, truthful. Is truth worthy a word? But he's going to get married at a young age. At the age of 25, he marries Khadiju, a 40-year-old widow. It's said that he's doing pretty well, pretty happy. He's got hooked up, pretty honest guy, having a pretty good living. And then something pretty special happens to him in 605. Now, Mecca was already seen as kind of a place that people would pilgrimage to, pre-Islamic. But they would be not just Christians and Jews, but pagans, polytheistic people, people that would go to something called the Kaaba. The Kaaba where they would put stones and idols and different worship ceremonies, but it was already a pretty religious place. And in 605, there's a crisis among the different religious leaders. And what had happened is during renovations of the Kaaba, they took out something called the Black Stone. And they couldn't agree who gets to put the Black Stone back. Everybody's like, I should put it back. No, I should put it back. So eventually they turn to somebody who's seen as being very honest and truthworthy and all this great jazz, and that's Muhammad. Now, Muhammad is then put in charge of putting that black rock back into the Kaaba. And this is before he has any revelations, but it's seen by many people who follow the faith as being a sign. Now in 610, he's going to have his first of many revelations. And it's very important to understand that we're going to be talking about a cave he goes to pray in. It's called Ahira, and he had gone there before, but he's called to pray, you know, in this cave, and he's visited by the archangel Gabriel. And Gabriel is a central figure in Islam. He's going to be the angel that communicates from God to Muhammad in the Islam Islamic faith, nobody can, is able to speak directly to God. So there has to be an intermediate, and that are angels. People of the Islamic faith believe in angels. They don't really represent them in the physical world on paintings and such like that, but that is a very important article of faith according to people who are Muslims. So he gets these revelations, and he's basically told that he needs to convert people, that he is going to be a great prophet now, that he is going to speak through you know Archangel Gabriel as the word of God and that he basically needs to teach people to submit to the Almighty. In the same tradition of Judaism and Christianity, there's one God, he is all powerful, he is all knowing, he is all merciful, but we need to submit, we need to give over, we need to pay homage. But he was also seen by many of the people that lived in Mecca as being a false prophet, as being an enemy, as being somebody who was trying to rock the boat, and they were like, don't rock the boat, baby. And then in 620, he has one of his greatest revelations where it said that he was transported during the nighttime to uh, a great mosque far away. Many Muslims believe that this is the Dome of the Rock, which is a very holy place of the Islamic faith. The same Dome of the Rock where people who are Jewish believe that Abraham went to sacrifice his son. So there's a lot of crossover going on here. There's also a lot of commonalities with Christianity that there is a belief in a judgment day that one day there will be a great reckoning, there will be an antichrist, there will be a judgment. And actually Muslims believe that it will be Jesus Christ who will defeat the antichrist and rule for 40 years over earth. So, you know, commonalities and overlaps. And I, I do believe that where Muhammad is buried, alongside of Ali and Abu Bakr, 
the two people who create the Shiite and the Sunni split right there, that there's an empty grave for the body of Jesus Christ. So it shows you that maybe there's a lot more in common between religions than you think. But nevertheless, he ascends into heaven where he meets the great prophets. He talks to Moses. He talks to Jesus. He learns all the ins and outs of the rules. He visits hell. Now he's got a story to tell. And then he descends back to earth, earth where the people that are following his new faith become to be persecuted even more. So then in 622, he decides, I'm getting out of Dodge. Well, I'm getting out of Mecca. And he has a pilgrimage with all of his people, an exodus, which is called a hijrah. And he moves his people to a new city called Medina, where he is welcomed. He is brought in as a new leader, somebody that is to unite the Christians and the Jewish people and the different ancient tribes. And this is done according to a constitution called the Constitution of Medina, where different things occur, where they start praying towards Mecca instead of Jerusalem, where there is tolerance for other faiths, but there's also the idea that Muhammad's going to be the guy in charge. So it's kind of a balance between a little bit of diversity, but the Muslims really having their first city in Medina. Now in 630, Muhammad's ranks are going to grow. He's going to have about 10,000 people under his command now. And he's going to make a new pilgrimage back to Mecca, a siege on Mecca. And that's going to be successful where the Meccans lay down their arms and Muhammad walks into Mecca as the great prophet, as the new leader, with a little empire growing at that point. First thing he does, goes back to the kebab and they destroy everything that is seen as a false idol. All of the gods and the goddesses and the pagan worship, that's going to be all gone from that standpoint. Point. And that Kaaba is going to be the holiest place for Muslims from now on. And in fact, they're commanded to even have to touch that black rock that we talked about before. So now that he has passed on, uh, the empire is not going to stop at that point. We're going to have what are called caliphates, which are going to be basically little dynasties of rulers. And there is actually a split in Islam between people who call themselves Sunnis and people who call themselves Shiites. Sunnis believe that the first caliphate was ruled under by uh, his father-in-law, Muhammad's father-in-law, Abu Bakr. People that are Shiites believe that it's not really until the fourth caliphate that we get the real ruler, which was his son-in-law, Ali. But we could talk about that a little bit later. Why don't we talk about some of the articles of faith of somebody who calls himself a Muslim who belongs to the religion of Islam. Where do you think the most Muslims live? Do you think it's in the Middle East? Do you think it's in Southeast Asia? Or do you think it's in Africa? What do you guys think? I'll take a guess right now. Ha! It's Southeast Asia. 32% of Muslims live in Southeast Asia. Only 20% live in the Middle East. But I get off track. So what do you need to know about people who follow the Islamic faith? Well, number one is the Quran. The Quran is seen as the literal word of God. And it's made up of 114 surahs or chapters. And there's 6,236 verses which must be spoken in Arabic and prayed in Arabic. That's critical as well. There's also something called the Hadiths, which are different accounts that were written down of Muhammad's life. The Quran is really a collection of ethics and morals and parables and ideas. And Muhammad's life is seen as how that is enacted in real life. And that forms the Hadiths and the Quran kind of Muslim law. Islamic law, which is called Sharia law. And we don't want to get political here because this isn't a political lecture, but Iran and Saudi Arabia actually practice Sharia law. And you can look it up itself. It's pretty gangster, kind of Hammurabi's code on steroids sometimes. But there are some downsides, certainly for women when it comes to what's seen as adultery or illicit sex, but it's also seen by many Muslims as being protectors of ethics and values about basic ideas that are in Christianity and Judaism as well. But I get off track. What I really want to talk about is the five pillars of Islam, because that's what you're going to need to know on the test. In fact, they're right here. I'm going to go pick them up and serve them up on a plate of learning. Let's get started. Shahada. Shahada is an article of faith. That's the first pillar. You have to give yourself up to the faith. You have to say the words, there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And once you say that, you can knock that off. You are done with the first pillar of Islam. It's an article of faith. 
Now the second is Salat, which is prayer. And all Muslims must pray five times a day, and that's marked off from sunrise to the end of the day, where they have to face Mecca. And there's certain rules about how they pray in terms of how they kneel and how they bow. But five times a day, if you want to be a Muslim, if you want to practice the Islamic faith, you're going to have to do it five times a day. That's the second pillar of Islam. The third is Zakat, which means charity, that this is a central tenet that you have to not be greedy, that according to your wealth, you have to give away a certain amount to people in your community that are less fortunate. So charity is one of the huge pillars of Islam. The fourth pillar of Islam is Saum, and I think I mispronounced that, but that means fasting, which occurs in the month of Ramadan. So for a whole month, from the time the sun comes up to the sign the sun goes down, you have to make sure that you don't eat. So that's a fasting, kind of a mm. obedience to God. You're submitting to the will. You're showing God how much you're willing to go through um, so you can make him happy. And then the fifth would be the Hajj. And the Hajj is for every man and woman Muslim who must make a trek to Mecca to the Kaaba to pray. And there's some other things they have to do in there as well. They have to touch the black stone. There's a symbolic stoning of the devil. But those are the five pillars of Islam. You guys could remember that. There's one about faith. There's one about praying, there's one about charity, there's one about fasting, and there's a pilgrimage that you have to make to Mecca. Five, that's it, you can do it. So guys, we hope that you understand the very basic idea behind Islam of what it means to be a Muslim, the story of Muhammad, and of course we've left out almost everything, which I'm sure you're going to find time to put down in the comments below. But I think my last message to you, and I haven't done this with the other videos because I'm a little bit more worried about this one, is that you have to remember that there's going to be different interpretations of every text. Some good, some bad, some ugly. So before we start throwing rocks at everybody, just put your rocks down and be kind to each other. And giddy up for the learning because that's the end of this lecture. We hope that your brain's bigger. We certainly hope you always remember where your attention goes, energy flows. And I'm gonna say it because I always say it, but I'll see you guys next time you press the buttons.